Wonderful. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Heather Price and welcome to our talk, Climate Justice Integrated Learning, Examples from Humanities and STEM. Uh, I'm a chemistry faculty member and I lead the Climate Justice Across the Curriculum Project at North Seattle College. And I'm also a climate scientist specializing in atmospheric chemistry and air pollution. Hi, I'm Carly Ikebara, and I'm a full-time faculty member in the Basic and Transitional Studies Department. And I was a participant in the Climate Justice Project this past summer, and I'm passionate about connecting students to current issues. Hi, I'm Christy Markowitz Santos, and I serve as Associate Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at North Seattle College. I also participated this summer. I'm a lifelong learner and really excited to be here with you all today. On behalf of the University of Washington and North Seattle College, we acknowledge that we occupy the traditional ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Duwamish tribe, a people that are still here, continuing to honor and bring to light their ancient heritage. Without them, we would not have access to this gathering, dialogue, and learning space. We ask that we take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. Okay, we're going to do quick introductions. Um, the first question we're going to answer in the chat. So the first question is, where are you? We are based out of Seattle. So I'm just north of Seattle. I believe Christy and Heather are both in Seattle. Um, so where are you all at? If you have a second, will you type it in the chat? Oh, someone from Long Beach. Yay! Shoreline. Hello, local. <laughs> oh, that's one of us. San Jose. Oh, we have two Californias. What are we going to ask? And then Winnebago tribe. I'm a native Californian, so it's nice to see California here representing. Nice. All right. Our next question is, what is your role? So we're going to be using the reactions um, at the bottom or at, on your uh, control bar. So if you're a student, please use the celebrate. If you're faculty, you can use the clapping button. If you're staff, you can use the heart button. If you're an administrator, you can laugh with us. <laughs> well, it looks like we got quite a few faculty, some administrators, some staff, yes. And then our last question is, do you currently integrate climate justice into your work? Is this something you already do? Give us a thumbs up in your reaction. Um, if you do, you can explain how in the chat if you want to. If not, that's okay. That's what we're talking about today. All right, back to you, Heather. So, I like to tweet and my tweet shown on the left follows my life in carbon dioxide from 326 parts per million when I was born to 415 when I posted this in May of 2019. We are at 417 today. And by the way, uh, this along with my dress illustrates the urgency of the climate crisis and also how climate connects with media, art, science, and fashion. So my dress shows global average temperatures from 1850 at my shoulder to 2019 at my knee and my friend is wearing the data for France. The red part of my dress, this is the lives of most of my our students. Um, anyone younger than 44 has never known a colder than average year in their lives. And many of our students already understand that climate and the climate crisis are rooted in racial and socioeconomic inequality and injustice. Their education needs to be relevant to these issues. And learning climate science in classes isn't enough. That's like a doctor giving you test results, but then not the information needed to repair and heal. Bridging the disciplines of humanities, arts, STEM, um, and all the disciplines together is necessary for the repair and care and to usher in the systemic changes needed to address both the climate crisis and the issues of systemic inequality and injustice. 
on my next slide, I'll describe intergenerational climate justice, which is illustrated by this photo of my children who are to the right of their great grandma. And it refers to the impact of one generation on another. For instance, the impact of one generation's resource use on future generations who are not yet here or do not yet have a voice. On the right, uh, the intra-generational climate justice refers to impacts within a generation. So everyone living today plays a role in intra-generational climate justice. For instance, the richest 0.54%, that's only 42 million people, their lifestyle emissions from flying, driving, big homes, and consumption are greater than the poorest half of the global population, which is over 3.6 billion people. The image on the right also shows the various wedges, such as education, gender, race, ability, employment, food, nutrition, healthcare, housing, all of these things that impact a person or a community's ability to contend with climate impacts that are happening right now. And because of historical oppression and colonization from rich countries and peoples, those who are most affected by intra-generational climate injustices are people in the global south and communities of color, particularly indigenous, black, and Latinx, uh, and, um, that are, and also folks that are living in rich countries um, from these communities. And now let's read some quotes from student climate justice activists. These are our students and uh, hear their ideas. So this first one is Aji Piper. He says in his congressional testimony, by the way, I am not a lawyer nor a climate scientist. I know from studying climate science and living with the consequences of climate change today that my health, my community and my future and that of my generation is at stake. Next, this is Vanessa Nakate in Uganda. We cannot achieve climate justice without racial justice. Next. Next. And I, uh, this is Jamie Margolin. I go to bed with wishful dreams of that beautiful near future post climate change world and every day I wake up and work to make it happen. You are one of the people alive today who has the power to shape life on earth forever. So what are you going to do with that? On to you, Christy. There's mounting evidence that in STEM disciplines in which Black, Indigenous, and Latinx groups are underrepresented, integrating climate justice into courses can promote student retention and success. And in fact, there were hints of this in the 90s when the book Talking About Leaving first came out as illustrated by this quote from a high-performing Black student who chose to leave an engineering major. Ebony McGee's work suggests that when we incorporate an equity ethic into teaching, as we are doing through our climate justice learning community workshops um, and the work that came out of them, it helps to retain underrepresented students um, who are minorities and women in STEM. Climate touches everything and should be in everything that we teach. It's critical that our students understand how this impacts them now and in their future beyond college. Um, and Carly, can you press next? Thanks. Um, concerns about climate change and its economic impact are moving their way into the workplace. Um, as you see here with this highlighted example from a job description um, from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. So we might not think that this is climate related um, and clearly it is. Next slide. When equity ethic is included as described in Dr. Ebony McGee's work at Vandermilt, we see retention of students in STEM. An email excerpt from a Black woman student in a North Seattle college chemistry class in, illustrates the benefit of including an equity ethic in STEM. She says, whenever you tell us information on the current environment, I would always pass it along to my friends and family. I truly appreciate you for waking me up regarding the environmental crisis we're in. Even being a STEM student, I wasn't aware as much as I should, and I can only imagine how other people are deprived of the knowledge and scary situation we're in, in terms of our climate. I have been accepted to the UW, UW chemical engineering program and will start this spring. 
I can't wait to actually be part of the problem solving community and hopefully come up with solutions to combat the climate crisis. This student's email illustrates not just STEM retention and success, but also civic and community engagement in her sharing what she learned with family and friends. Talking about climate is a form of civic and community engagement that's needed to shift culture and address the climate crisis. Next slide. Uh, this is an excerpt from, or excuse me, the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication um, at Yale and George Mason University have been following Americans' concern about global warming. And this illustrates that today, more than three quarters of Americans are concerned or alarmed about global warming. The most recent polls conducted at Yale shows that both Black and Latinx Americans are much more concerned and alarmed about climate change than white Americans. It's also interesting to note the sex-based differences. Um, this information tells us a story that BIPOC communities are concerned because of the disproportionate impact that climate change will have and is already having on our communities. Back to you, Heather. So teaching in the context of climate justice is more than just teaching the facts or the science. It means teaching using a systems thinking approach that connects issues that our students, they already care about in the real world with the tools and skills that are needed to address the problems that they're learning about and that some of them are facing themselves. And we do this by including civic or community engagement into our curriculum as a way to teach climate science and the climate justice aspects. Next slide. So here's a fly, the flyer um, advertising the faculty learning community that I facilitated and that Carly and Christy participated in this past summer. This workshop is based on the initial work of curriculum for the bioregion and climate justice workshops initially developed and run by Dr. Sonia Doucette at Bellevue College and that I have brought to the Seattle colleges and am currently facilitating at University of Washington. You'll notice there's a $700 stipend for faculty to do this work. It's important to pay faculty, especially underpaid and overworked community college faculty for their time. Four workshop days took place over summer quarter of 2020 with two weeks between each meeting. This spacing allowed time for faculty to reflect on their readings, discussions, and to design their curriculum. Over to you, Carly. So I'm one of the faculty members who participated in this learning community. Um, I had been interested in climate justice outside of the classroom prior to this, but I had never figured out the logistics of integrating it into the classroom, not to mention to find the time to um, create the curriculum and the connections across the campus. So this learning community gave me the time, the space, and the compensation in order to create those connections across campus and to create the curriculum to integrate climate justice into my classrooms. Next slide. So here's a list of the curriculum and campus activities that were created by North Seattle College um, faculty and staff in English, ESL, statistics, physics, and chemistry. So I was very intentional in making sure that both humanities and STEM and staff were in the same room to learn from each other. In science, I'm a chemist, I'm a PhD chemist, we're taught to present just the science. But now I've learned that that's like a doctor giving you test results and then failing to give you the information to repair and heal. Now I know that STEM faculty in particular benefit from working alongside humanities faculty and staff who are often already comfortable including equity and justice examples in their classes. In just one quarter, we estimate that over 200 students have encountered a climate justice lesson in their class or at a school event such as the Indigenous Peoples Day events that Christy and Carly organized. Next. So the class that I was integrating climate justice ideas into was my upper intermediate English to speakers of other languages class. And some of the concept that, some concepts that we cover are grammar usage, reading comprehension and academic writing. And you can see here how those, com those concepts are broken down into more specific skills. And we use these skills um, to facilitate the climate, just, the climate justice learning in our classes. And looking at the next slide, we'll see that these are some of the climate justice ideas that we had suggest that we were given as suggestions to incorporate into our class lesson or into our assignment. 
And these come from this book that's shown here, Drawdown. And Drawdown was provided to all of us as participants, and it's also available to buy online. But some of the ideas here are like indigenous traditional knowledge, whitewashing of the climate movement, access to family planning, and food security. And I incorporated several of these into my lessons in my class last quarter. As Heather was saying, it's not enough to just teach students about climate justice, but also giving them the next step of something that they can do. So these are some ideas for some civic and community engagement that are now included in the climate workshops. Um, we need to empower students and give them the skills and tools to address the problems that, they, that they're learning about. And some of these ideas here include like collecting or donating foods and goods, talking with friends or family, community problem solving, creating display buttons, logos, signs, or stickers. And these are all ways that students can get involved in their community and help to promote climate justice. This here is an example of a blank organizer that we used to help organize the different moving parts that needed to be taken into consideration when integrating climate justice into an assignment or a lesson. And it's filled out, it looks something like this. So this is my completed version of the organizer. Because of the nature of the class I teach, the outcomes really lended themselves easily for teaching other content alongside it. And in particular, in this case, climate justice content. Because it was fall quarter, my general theme was food in the land. Um, I focused on including readings and assignments that allowed students to learn about the indigenous peoples who are from and still live in the Pacific Northwest and the foods that they hold sacred. So looking at my assignment, one of the outcomes for this class is to summarize and critically think about readings. I wanted the students to see how indigenous peoples care for the land and are connected to it. So they could understand why um, later on when we learned about indigenous women for climate justice movement, they could understand why the women are so passionate about their cause and about how it's affecting them maybe more than other people in the community. Um, the article that I chose is an open source article from the Since Time Immemorial Curriculum. And the article briefly introduces the native peoples of the Pacific Northwest, their history, and their connection with the land. We looked at the key vocabulary, the grammar, the way it was used, and what sacred responsibilities were, and how those responsibilities may have been affected over the years. I then tasked the students to look into the native peoples of their homelands and the ways that they take care of, their, of the land previously and how they do now. And so the civic engagement piece was to briefly introduce the basics of the history of the land and the original caretakers of the place that we are currently occupying. A lot of the students in my class are new to the Seattle area or possibly new to the US. So having them learning about the people that are in their community was a big, um, a big bonus for us in our class. Now here's Heather with a bit about her class. So here's one of the modules um, that I created showing how I connect climate justice and civic engagement in a STEM majors general chemistry class. And the chemistry concepts included balancing equations, states of matter, oxidation numbers, elements, molecules, compounds, right? It was kind of a review. Um, and I'll describe the, the climate justice and civic engagement pieces in my organizer. So here's my organizer. Uh, the climate justice ideas included native sovereignty, indoor air quality, and the health impacts from methane gas, which is so-called natural gas, um, that is commonly used for heating and cooking in many buildings and homes. For instance, one of the climate justice issues is children living in homes with methane gas stoves have a 42% increased risk of currently suffering from asthma and a 24% increased risk of lifetime asthma. Methane is 8,400% stronger at global heating than carbon dioxide is, and it's a gas, so it leaks. And when it leaks, methane is worse than coal or oil in terms of its global heating potential. 
Uh, and for the civic and community engagement piece, students were asked to share what they learned with a friend or a family member and to write a reflection of this discussion. And they were also asked to uh, answer the following questions. What can an individual do to reduce childhood asthma from gas stoves? Um, the same question, but what could a community do? And then the third question is who benefits when actions are made by individuals versus who benefits when communities uh, change systems? Next. Thanks, Heather. Yes. Uh, one of our values and processes in the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at North where I work is to work closely with community and campus partners um, on collaborative events and to always be building community into our work. So after the work that we did together this summer or this past summer in our climate justice workshop, I wanted to bring this important lens to our upcoming Indigenous Peoples Day for several reasons. Uh, clearly BIPOC communities are the most concerned about climate change and the greatest impacted. Um, and so because climate change is inextricably connected to Indigenous traditional ecological knowledge and because of colonization and displacement, um, most, if not all, Indigenous lands have been harmed and impacted by climate change. Uh, so my office worked with our Urban Native Education Alliance partners, uh, the Yihau filmmakers, and folks from the climate justice learning community to create a program that celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day with a focus on climate justice. Our core programming was a documentary double feature where we screened two films that talked about the history and present day misuse colonization of the land and the impact that it's had on the land itself and the indigenous communities who live here. Uh, the first was Saving Licton Springs and the Im image <laughs> is right there on the left of the slide, um, a documentary by Clear Sky Youth Leadership Council that explored the work to protect Licton Springs and mark it as a Seattle historical site. And the second is Yehau, a local indigenous film that uncovers the natural gas, natural gas pipeline that was put through Snohomish land and has really greatly impacted the community, both by um, uh, hurting salmon populations and causing damage when pipes burst. Um, so this was really critical and important to us. And that's why we put it together. Uh, following the screening of the films, we had a really moving discussion about the connection between Indigenous Peoples Day and climate justice. And uh, Carly so graciously facilitated a discussion of indigenizing climate justice, um, an article by Dr. Jessica Hernandez, uh, who is a, um, a, a scientist uh, and an indigenous person who's really committed to this work. Um, and we compared and contrasted the pillars of climate justice and the indigenous pillars of climate justice, centering climate change as an inherently indigenous issue and indigenous ways of knowing and traditional ecological knowledge as approaches and strategies to climate justice and climate wisdom. And what we learned from this project and celebration is that our community is really committed to climate justice in our work and that climate change and its disproportionate impact on BIPOC communities is just a general deep concern for all of us. So it was really powerful to experience this type of complex and meaningful collaboration and just have a really successful celebration with our community. So um, thank you, Heather and Carly, both for your work. Yes, thank you. And I'm excited to announce that this work that we have started and that really Sonia Doucette started years ago at Bellevue College, um, that Sonia and I uh, now have a new National Science Foundation grant to continue this work. And it's called Climate Justice in Undergraduate STEM Incorporating Civic Engagement. And so we were just awarded this grant about, about two weeks ago. And so we'll start the work on that during spring quarter and it'll go for the next three years. And uh, next slide, any questions? And we can open it up um, to questions in the chat or um, you can take yourself off mute and ask your questions. And we have about five minutes for questions. Yes, thank you. We're very excited about the grant. <laughs> Is 
And then a question, is it possible to get a slide deck? Um, yes, I am happy to share uh, the resources, um, even from the workshop that we have. Um, it, Sonia and I both feel very strongly that this information, this type of work needs to be out there. So we are very happy to share uh, how we teach our workshops, the slides that we use, how we set those up. Um, I'm currently teaching it at University of Washington with a group of 12 faculty, professors there. And uh, so, you know, we've, we've been doing this for a long time. We're happy to share. If you guys would like to send that to me, I can upload it to the attendee hub and the participants can download it from there. Will do. Port Angeles. I, I was born in Port Angeles, so welcome. <laughs> it's awesome. I just brought up our emails as well, so that if anybody has specific questions that um, are not have not been covered here and might take more time, there's some email addresses for the three of us. Yeah. And um, I also, another project that I'm involved in community is this project called Talk Climate. So a number of the same resources that the faculty use in the workshop are also available on Talk Climate um, and it's talkclimate.org. So you're also um, welcome to use any of those. And that's a community of, uh, medical and mental health professionals, elders, musicians, uh, artists, educators, parents. I mean, it, it really is in community, this, this project. Any other questions? And feel free to take yourself off mute if you um, would rather verbally give your question. Well, if, if no one has any questions, I'm curious, Carly, um, if you could just share a little bit about how your um, English as a second, third, fourth, fifth language students um, responded to learning about climate justice um, to maybe inspire some faculty. Yeah, it was um, really interesting because a lot of them had heard of climate change, but never of climate justice. And so they were really curious about it at first and then a little bit horrified by it as we kept going. And um, I don't think that they realized that there was a different impact on different people. And um, a lot of them also, their cultures may be the first peoples in that land. And so they, don't, they didn't understand the, the US climate between um, you know, occupying other people's lands. And so when we were getting to talking about Thanksgiving and talking about um, just how the staple foods are viewed and how they are no longer available or as available, um, they were like, why would you do that? And uh, just, you know, it was a lot of very serious conversations and a lot of um, things I feel like they felt they were misled by the larger media in the US. So it was interesting that definitely a lot of a lot of um, good conversations and a lot of learning about the community. Yeah, I think a, a lot of what comes out of this work is people realizing with climate change and ecological changes, we're all in the same storm, but we are in very different boats. Some of us are in yachts and some of us are in milk carton boats <laughs> in the same storm. Yes, and unfortunately, the people who are in yachts are usually the ones who are helping create the storm. Yeah, yeah, the yachts are the one that are creating the pollution for sure. <laughs> it's just to the work of New York Times and Democracy Now. Yep. Wonderful. And there's a comment, uh, point students to work of the New York Times and Democracy Now. Thank you for your time and expertise. Yes, thank you. Yeah, there's lots and lots of um, resources out there. Um, uh, one of my favorites is the Yale Climate Communication uh, with Tony uh, Zerowitz. 
Um, they have a weekly uh, kind of a podcast that Tony puts out and also a number of resources. Yeah, Yale Climate Communications. And it's in uh, with uh, George Mason as well. So I think Carly um, or uh, Christy had mentioned that with uh, the circles, right? Who's concerned about climate change? I think we have about one more minute. So any last questions that folks might have? There's about 15 seconds. 15 seconds. All right. Well, I guess we'll just say our goodbyes then. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming and for your wonderful comments and questions. And please email us if you have others. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.